Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory, glory, glory. How's everybody tonight? Blessed and highly favored and flavored. You know, salt is used for preserving. We are the salt of the world because we're the preserved of the world, not because of what we eat. Amen. Not because of the preservatives we eat, because we're the salt. We can't allow the salt to lose its flavor. Glory. Hallelujah. Yeah. Would you turn to the book of Romans, please? The book of Romans. In chapter 1. We go to the book of Romans, so we stop Roman. Let's speak it. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of the anointing of God Almighty, <laughs> the Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the what? Power. Power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jews first and also to the Greek. So it is the power to salvation. How many of all you need power to maintain salvation? See, without power, you don't. And that's what he's saying. He said, without the power of God, you come to a place where you surrender your salvation for the things of the world. You give up. You lose the thirst and hunger. You lose it. Without the power of God, the anointing of Christ, the eternal presence, power, and truth, God Almighty, we cannot maintain salvation. Does everybody get this? That's what he's speaking about here. Again, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. That means to what? Follow. So without the power of the Holy Spirit, it is impossible, unless you're dying on your deathbed and you choose to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Amen? But that's, a, that's not the place you want to get to, is it? You don't want to wait till you're giving up your last breath and say, oh, God, save me. You want to build treasures in heaven. Amen? You want to build things. You want to do things that are according to the will of God that not only please him but bless him. And your heart is always about kingdom business because we're kingdom builders, right? Amen. Amen. So he says something very important. This is profound. We need the power of God to maintain salvation. It's real simple. Verse 18, or 17, I'm sorry. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, and it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. And unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without what? Excuse. They are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were what? Dark and why? Because they did not maintain the power of Christ, which is the anointing. I could talk about the anointing till we go home. Because people still don't grasp the understanding in certain areas. It is not only powerful, but it is delicate. And it's an area where you and I must come to, to understand not only about the anointing of Christ, because this is what it's all about. 
It's about his presence. It's about his power. It's about his truth. It's about his love. See, without the anointing, you and I are nothing. We have no power. And that's the difference. You can tell when people are walking in the power of God and when they're not walking in the power of God. Amen? Does everybody get this? Amen. And when we tried doing it in our own strength and we couldn't do it. We tried it. We made many promises to God and just couldn't fulfill it. We made promises to ourselves. And we couldn't do it. And he says here, look at many of them. They didn't give glory to God anymore. They became futile in their thoughts. And their hearts were dark. And why? Because they did not maintain the power of Christ. They did not. They weren't thirsty and hungry. They were more thirsty and hungry for fulfillment of self, for the things of the world. And they lost the presence. They grieved the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you. So many times in certain circumstances, it's very easy to grieve him. And in certain circumstances, it's hard to grieve him. Depending on what's what. He never gives up on us. Amen? But there's a place where when we start speaking about how much we know God and how much we believe and all of these other things and you do something that grieves the Holy Spirit, there's an area that where he steps right back. Why? Because he's going to let you stumble so that pride is removed or exposed. The moment we make decisions according to our own will and desires, We've just walked away. Amen. Amen. That's why we talked about delighting yourself in the Lord. And then he gives you the desires. Amen. So in this, it's an area where, especially in these last days, man, without the power of God, we're going to be easily deceived, easily misled, easily swayed, easily influenced. We're to come out of the world. Amen. And when we come out of the world, the world is to come out of us. See, some people are trying to come out of the world, but they're not willing to let the world come out of them. And that can only be done by the power of God. Oh, glory. It says here, verse 22, professing to be wise, they became what? Fools. And changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and the birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Therefore, God also gave them up to what? uncleanness in the lust of their heart to dishonor their bodies among themselves. In other words, God will just, when you, that happens, the Lord steps back, the power is lifted, and he lets you go. And the first thing that's going to happen is lust. Love of self, lust, and other desires of worldliness. You'll be more concerned about how you adorn yourself than what God thinks. You'll be more concerned of what man thinks about you than what God thinks about you. In fact, you get to a point where that anointing begins to more and more lift from you, and all of a sudden, you don't really care what God thinks about you. You care what man thinks about you. Even though and there's an inner part that says you care what God thinks, but you keep drowning it, drowning it, and drowning it. And that's what happens when we walk away from the anointing, when we walk away from the power of Christ. And then we become more religious. We begin to come, we get justified and compromised, complacent, and we call ourselves good, but we can't call ourselves righteous. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go a little further. So we need the power of God to maintain true salvation. Or else we'll be easily swayed with deception, letting go of righteousness of God into rebellion of Satan's agenda. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Would you read it with me, please? I do not write these things to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you. For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, Yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you to imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ 
as I teach everywhere in every church. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills, and I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. The kingdom of God is in power. The kingdom of God is in what? Power. The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. In other words, this area is conduct. It is in your conduct. What is that conduct? It's called the divine nature. That is the power of Christ that overcomes the carnal nature. You no longer live for you. You live for him. It is the conduct that overcomes evil temptations. It is the character. It is the divine nature of God Almighty. Is everybody okay? Oh, hallelujah. Let's go a little further. For, uh, let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1, verse 26. Luke 1, 26. Let's speak it together. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of David forever. And of his kingdom there will be what? No end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will what? Come upon you and the what? And the power. The Holy Spirit in power. The Holy Spirit in power of the highest will what? Overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now, indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month of her, for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. The Holy Spirit and power, those are together. The Holy Spirit and in power. What does he do? He comes over you. See, there's an area when, man, when the Holy Spirit is not only in you, but when he comes on you. There's a unification and there's anointing. It's like when you, when you take two stones and spark them together, poof, fire comes. Does everybody got it? So the Spirit in you and the Spirit comes upon you, bam, fire. Luke 4. And verse 1 says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was what? Led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Okay. Holy Spirit comes. There's always being... When, listen. Holy Spirit always leads. When Holy Spirit comes, He leads. When He comes, He leads. That's why we must invite Him to everything. We're either being led or misled. And everything you and I do, we're either being led or misled. One or the other. Because if you're not being led, you're being misled. But it says once you are filled with the Spirit of God, what are you doing? You're yielding. You're allowing Him to what? Lead. Because if you're not being led, you're what? Misled. 
So he, what does he do? He leads them into the wilderness to be tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing, and afterward, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to be bre become bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but every word of God. Listen, when the Holy Spirit leads, no temptation can overcome you. Does everybody get it? See, but it all starts with what? Being filled with the Spirit. Because the Spirit brings what? Power. Power to what? Overcome. Everything is constantly overcoming. Overcome. Overcome temptation. Overcome influence. Overcome. So when you are filled, you are led. If you're truly filled, you are led. That means you must yield. You must willing to surrender. You don't fight for survival. You surrender. Then the devil taking him up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in the moment of time. And the devil said to him, all, the, all this authority I'll give you and their glory for this has been delivered to me and I give to whomever I wish. And that's true, isn't it? Anyone willing to serve the devil? Praise God. The problem is, is that's all I get. There is no reward after the last breath, is there? Therefore, if you will worship before me, I will be yours. Let me share something with you. The devil doesn't come to you and say, hey, worship me today. Let me share with you, very, very important. Rebellion is worshiping the devil. See, people think that, well, I didn't worship the devil. Rebellion is worshiping the devil. Why? Because if you don't submit to God, then who do you submit to? The devil. And so you're giving one service. If you're giving one service, you're giving one worship. Therefore, if you'll worship me before me, it's all yours. And Jesus answered and said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. How many of y'all now know that the devil will challenge you? He challenges you. He, what does he do? He challenges you to tempt God. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you and keep you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. How many of y'all know the devil knows the Bible? Boy, he can quote scriptures very good. Probably better than any one of us. The problem is he can't walk it. Sound familiar? Why? Because he's the number one religious dude. He loves religion. Why? Because it brings people into bondage. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. And when the devil had ended every temptation and departed from him until a what? Opportune time. Now look at Jesus was led by the Spirit. First he got filled with the Spirit. Then he was led by the Spirit. He got tempted. He overcame all the temptations. And you know what happened? He got stronger. Watch. And it says here, Now when the devil had ended all, and then come back at an opportune time, verse 14, Then Jesus returned in the what? In the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news went out through all the surrounding region. Let me share with you that when the devil comes with more temptations, if you're, being, if you're filled and you're led, the anointing gets stronger. God will never allow the enemy to overpower you. We do. Does everybody get it? We do. God doesn't. We do. And once we submit to the voice of the stranger, then we reject the voice of God. Amen? So we're the ones that allow it. Why? Because then we're not being led anymore. We're being what? 
misled. Oh, praise God. Filled, led, empowered. You know, many people run after the first temptation because they weren't led. Or actually because they weren't filled. Because it's hard to be led if you're not filled. Amen? But you can be filled, be led, and then accept the voice of the stranger and become misled. Because you're not yielding to the Spirit. You begin to yield to something else. Acts 10. But there must be a desire in your heart. Does everybody get this? Everything starts with a, a heart desire to want to please God. If it's not there, then you're not his. Acts 10. Is everybody okay? Okay. Verse 38 and verse 37. That word you know which was proclaimed throughout Judea and began from Galilee after the baptism which John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good. Doing good. Is that good conduct? Yes. Remember, the anointing always promotes and expresses the divine nature. That's the number one. It's not about what your works are. Does everybody get it? It's the character. It's the character. It's the divine nature character. Our conduct. Is it submitting to God? Is it rebellious? What is our conduct? Is the divine nature of God there? Are we still holding bitterness or anger or frustration? Are we still holding things? Are we actually really submitting to God? Are we allowing to be filled with the Spirit of God? Listen, God will not fill you without a desire to be filled. God will not give you anything unless the desire is there to want it. He will not force anything on me or you. Amen? He doesn't force us. But we get to a point where we finally say, help, after we hit enough walls. So Jesus was anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. In other words, deceived, for God was with him. Again, the anointing, the Holy Spirit, power, God is with us. In other words, the anointing allows heaven to back us. So when you stand before the devil, the devil ain't looking at you. He's looking at all of heaven who's backing you. Amen. Glory. The divine conduct overcomes the evil. Amen. The carnal, the flesh. In Matthew 3. That's why we do a Friday night anointing service. But there's something you got to do on Friday night. You must sow. Your heart must be set, your mind must be set, and you are praising and worshiping him personally. You're setting your heart and your mind and your will to him. Because he says, if you'll seek me with all of your heart, your mind, and your will and strength, you will find me. That's how you find him. See, it's not a ritual. It becomes a desire. Now we, we're in a river and we walk around a river because we're allowing personal walls to come down. And while we're walking around the river and the prayer request, the angels are coming and grabbing hold and, and looking at the prayer requests and they're moving on them. 
And then while you're seeking your heart, your mind, and your will and strength towards the Lord, you're being filled. But if you're just walking around and not sowing and just chatting and whatever else, then you're not being filled. Then you're there to talk to people instead of being filled when you're supposed to be being filled so you can be led. So it's a terrible thing to start off on a misled. Amen? Oh, glory. Matthew 3, is everybody there? Verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. And when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a what? Dove. That is called the mantle. It's called the what? The mantle. The mantle comes upon you. It is the mantle of God. That's what's called seal. It is the mantle of the Holy Spirit that comes upon you. And I want you to know that the anointing is not for your pleasures. The anointing is for service. Amen? And he said, that, and, 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 um, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and a lightning upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, this is my beloved child, my beloved son. I'm telling you, when the anointing comes, when the filling of the Holy Spirit, when the mantle comes, it's relationship. No more religion. It's relationship. Father, son. Father, daughter. What did he say? This is my beloved son in whom I'm what? Well, please. Why? Because you sought me with all of your heart. You sought me with all of your mind and all of your might. You loved me. You wanted so much of me that you wanted my spirit and I fill you. And here's my mantle. The dove is the mantle. It's the covering. It's the seal. It's relationship. Why? Because it's pleasing to the Father. 2 Kings chapter 2. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In verse 1, let's speak it together. And it came to pass when the Lord was about to take Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now, Gilgal is a representation of a place of sacrifice. It's where circumcision is associated with also. So it's, it's a place where it's the cutting away. There must be a, a desire, a heart's desire to cut away. That's called sacrifice. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Bithel. But Elisha said, As the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bithel. Well, Elisha wanted what Elijah had. He wanted more of God. He says, ain't no way. I'm keeping my eyes on you. I know you're departing from me. See, he'd been underneath him and training him for a period of time. He was getting ready to receive the mantle. In other words, the impartation. And, and Elijah did wonderful miracles. He did all kinds of stuff. And God was with him. So they went to what? Bithel. That was a place which is known as Bithel. is known as the house to build. So there's an area. In other words, you have to have desire. You must have a desire to what? Build. Amen. Okay. Now, in verse 3. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he said, Yes, I know. 
keep silent. What was trying to happen? They were trying to bring what? Discouragement. They were trying to mislead. And the word tells us that after you get filled with the Spirit of God, men are going to look at you like they're going to persecute you. Why? Because you're going to be different than the world. You have a different character, a different nature. You have a different desire, a different will. It's totally different. It isn't about how much scripture you quote. Because you're expressing the word of God. You are the living word of God. You are that epistle. It is the conduct that you carry now, which is called a divine nature, which is power over all influence and any influence and over all temptations because you are empowered and all of heaven is behind you. In verse 4, then Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. For So they came to Jericho. Jericho is a place of personal walls breaking down. Now the sons of the prophets who were at Jericho came to Elijah and said to him, Do you know that the Lord will take away your master from over you today? And he answered and said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. How many times was he tempted? Three times. Who else was tempted three times? Jesus. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here, please, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho the Jordan. But he said, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Jordan is a place of new birth. New birth. And 50 men of the sons of the prophets went and stood facing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Now Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, and struck the water. What did the mantle represent? The anointing. And it divided this way and that, so that the two of them crossed over on dry ground. So it was when they had crossed over that Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I may do for you before I am taken away from you. Let me tell you, there's a place where even the Lord will say, What can I do for you? Elisha said, please, let a double portion of your spirit be upon me. He didn't ask for a Mercedes. He didn't ask for a, a wife. He didn't ask for anything. What did he ask for? More of him. Do you think that pleased him? Amen. <laughs> and he said, you have asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, all things are, are possible to those who believe. If you see me when I am taken from you, in other words, you better keep your eyes on me. It shall be so for you, but if not, it shall not be so. So he couldn't be distracted, could he? All the distractions. <laughs> a little leaven leavens a whole lump. Petty distractions. It caused people to drift off course. Then it happened, verse 11, as they continued on and talked, that suddenly a chariot of fire up appeared with horses of fire and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by the whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried out, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. So he saw him no more. And he took he took hold of his own clothes and tore them into two pieces. He also took up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. Then he took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and he struck the water and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he had also struck the water, it was divided this way and that, and Elijah crossed over. Now when the sons of the prophets who were from Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elijah. And they came to greet him and bowed 
um, bow to the ground before him. Now, I want you also to know that John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. He came with the mantle. Amen. What did he come for? To prepare the way of the Lord. Does everybody get it? Oh, glory. Now, in verse 16. Then they said to him, Look, now there are 50 strong men with your servants. Please let them go and search for your master, lest perhaps the Spirit of the Lord has taken him up, cast him upon some mountain or in some other valley. And he said, You shall not send anyone. But when they urged him till he was ashamed, he said, Send them. Therefore, they sent 50 men, and they searched for three days, but did not find him. And when they came back to him, for he had stayed in Jericho, he said to them, Did I not say to you, Do not go? Then the men of the city said to Elisha, Please notice the situation of the city is pleasant, as my Lord sees, but the water is bad, and the ground is barren. So he said, Bring me a new bowl, and put salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the source of the water and cast in the salt there and said, Thus says the Lord, I have healed this water from, its, from there shall be no more death or, or barrenness. So the water remains healed to this day according to the word of Elijah, which he spoke. Why? Because God was with him. Why? Through the anointing, the mantle. Is everybody okay? John 14. Now, we went through all that for this. John 14. Verse 12. Let's speak it most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also in greater works than these he will do, because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper or comforter, that he may abide with you forever. He is known as the Spirit of what? Spirit of truth. Spirit of truth. Everyone say, Spirit of truth. Whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not lead you, leave you orphans. I will come to you. He is known as the spirit of what? Truth. He will guide us to all truth. He tells us things to come. In this area of the, called the spirit of truth, not only is he the helper and the comforter and tells us truth, and he, what he does is he unveils the king in us. He unveils the king in me and you. He guides us and gives us revelation. He brings the word of God life and he manifests the divine nature and the divine power. I'll say this again. He unveils the king to you. He brings the words of God to life. He brings revelation. One of the revelations is who you are. He manifests his divine nature and the divine power. Remember, the divine nature and the divine power is the conduct and the character of Christ that overcomes the influence so that we are not swayed or misled, but we are led. Yes, there's other attributes. Casting out devils, laying hands on the sick, and so forth. Amen? But there's also seven attributes Amen, which is the wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, and so forth. He gives us all of these things. And then there's the nine gifts of the Spirit. All of these are in me and you. But to overcome anything. We really don't have an excuse when we're filled with the Spirit of God. The only reason why we don't overcome is because we listen to the voice of the devil and we get misled. So we really don't have any excuse because God gives us the power always to overcome. Always. Amen? 
Go to verse 5 and 6. The spirit of truth, the comforter, the helper. Glory. And Thomas said to him, what? Lord, we do not know where you are going and how we can know, how can we know the way? And Jesus said, I am the what? The way, I am the truth, and I am the life. I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the what? Okay. Jesus was expressing that he is the tabernacle of God. The truth is called the second chamber. Everyone say the second chamber because that's tonight's teaching, the second chamber. The way is known as the outer court. The truth is known as the holy place. And the life is known as the most holy place. And there are many who are not living in the second chamber. Or some have one foot in the second chamber and one foot in the outer court. But only in the second chamber where truth is, is power. Some people have never reached the second chamber and they've died before they even got there. So they got saved. But again, most of them have had to repent before they died. Does everybody get it? Because you cannot go all the way on this earth without the power of Christ. Remember, it says it is the power to salvation. The power to salvation. If we're filled, we're led. Amen? If we're led, we, uh, we overcome. Why? Because God will not send you into a place for you to lose a battle. He sends you into a place for victory every time. And he backs you with heaven and the anointing, the mantle that comes upon you. There's been many times I wonder, Lord, you're sending me to this place. I sure don't sense your presence. But as soon as I get there, bam, the anointing comes. The mantle is released and the spirit in me, touch the anointing in me, touches the anointing and there's fire and there's power. And there's overcome. Even when you want to do something, they can't affect you. Everybody got it. It is the second chamber of the tabernacle. It is called the life. We, you and I, live a life of power. It's not a life of religion. It's a life of power. Acts chapter 1. The second chamber. Can you imagine if everybody understood this? Can you imagine how far people were united in the body of Christ? A life of power can only be in the second chamber. So you and I that live in the second, we want to live in the second chamber so we want to have, but always having access to the third chamber, which is the most holy place. See, by living always in the uh, third chamber, it ain't, it's not easy to function here. So you have one foot in the third chamber and one foot in the second chamber. <laughs> Because you can't function here in the third chamber. You'd be too drunk all the time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive what? Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, the mantle. And you shall be what? Witnesses to me. How can you be a witness without power? Amen. In Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. We hear about a lot of witnesses out there, but they sure ain't got no power. Man, you talk about the anointing of the Holy Spirit, they run. 
You start praying in tongues, they're, they're gone. And so you see the bottom of their feet. The power, again, it is the power of conduct, of the character of Christ, the divine nature, to be a witness. See, but if you're not being, if you're not maintaining being filled, you can't be led. So many people have leaks, holes. They try to get filled and constantly flowing out because of things that they're still touching and agreeing with the world. They, that's, what, that's where leaks come from. Why? Because it's unclean. Anything that comes clean will not allow, it won't stay in an unclean place. Amen? Oh, praise God. Acts 26. Sometimes people come, they get filled, and they feel all great. Yeah, they walk out. Two, an hour later, they're, they're in the flesh. Fleshed out like crazy. That wasn't a leak. That was a drain. <laughs> you got to remember, the enemy comes to what? Steal. Steal. He don't want you to walk in the power. He wants you to grieve the Holy Spirit. He wants you to sow in the flesh. Because he knows you, if, you can, if he can cause you to sow in the flesh, then he can access you. Amen? You mean after I get filled with the Spirit of God, the devil can come and take me? Yeah. Take you right out of position. Because you still have the power to choose. You might not have the power of the Holy Spirit, but you still have the power to choose. <laughs> Verse 12, is everybody there? 26, 12. Everybody okay? Are you getting this? Everyone say the second chamber. Second chamber. Let's read it and be uh, 26. Yeah, let's go. Cool. All right. Well, thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priest, at midnight, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we all had fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me, saying in Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which you will yet reveal to you. I will yet reveal to you. Everybody speak this. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. To what? Open their eyes. You got to remember, Saul just had a visitation from the Lord who became Paul. God anointed him, didn't he? To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to what? Light. And from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and then an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is living in the second chamber. This is what you and I are called to do. That's all we're to do is we're carriers of the anointing. We're carriers of the eternal power, presence, and truth of God Almighty. That's what we're to do. We're either carriers of God's presence or carriers of Evil presence. Whichever one we're yielding to. Amen? But this is what you and I are called to do. Look how many people who still do not see. Look how many people have turned back to darkness. Look how many people have turned back to the power of Satan. Or still bound by the power of Satan. Just because people are good doesn't mean they're free. Amen? Living in the holy place. It's called the second chamber. Amen. Colossians chapter 1.
in verse 9. Let's speak it together. For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. That cannot be accomplished without the presence of the Holy Spirit and the power of Christ. Just can't do it on your own. And long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us, everyone say qualified, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through Him and what? And for Him. You and I are qualified partakers of what? The divine nature. Divine nature. Second Peter chapter 1. See, when you're filled with the Spirit of God, you know truth. And whatever is not truth, and you choose to sway to it, you'll be convicted. Amen? There's a conviction. No. No, no, don't go there. But you got to be filled with the Spirit. Second Peter verse 1, verse 2. I mean, Second Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Is everybody there? Great and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. And His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and what? Godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been, see have been given to us exceedingly and great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the what? Divine nature or the conduct. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For these things are yours and abound. You will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Why? Because you cannot be overcome when you're walking in the anointing. Amen? If you're living in the second chamber, you cannot be taken. You cannot be deceived. Only if you allow it. Now I'm going to close at Ephesians 6. Meaning I got deceived because I allowed it? Yep. Yeah. What comes on you and me is what we allow. Ephesians 6.10. Is everybody there? Let's speak it. Finally, my brethren, be what? Strong in the Lord and the what? Power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the what? The wiles, the trickeries of the devil. But he said, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. What's he talking about? The anointing. It can only come by living in the second chamber. 
For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rules of the darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Does everybody get it? In other words, you and I can't do anything in our own strength. We will always lose. Always. But we are only victorious in his strength. That's why the word says you can do all things through Christ, the anointing that strengthens us. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Why? Because in the presence of God, there's what? Joy. It says in it is right here and are what? Pleasures forevermore. Listen, God ain't trying to get, take something from you. He's trying to get something to you. And when you are walking in that place, nothing matters. Amen? You no longer live for you. You live for him. And you have the power. Sounds like the old song, secular song. I have the power. They didn't have poop. They had nothing but flesh. They were screaming out, we have the power. The only power there was demonized. But we got the eternal. Amen? Why? Because this is, again, it is the power unto salvation. So without the power of Christ, it's very difficult to maintain that place, isn't it? People sway very easily, get easily deceived. Why? Because they're not walking in the second chamber, which is the place of truth. Truth. Practicing truth. See, they may know it in the, in the first court. They may know the truth. But they can't practice it. You can only practice it in the second chamber because you have the power to. Amen? That's where the divine nature is expressed. Our choice. How hungry and thirsty are we? Are we willing to do whatever it takes? Are we willing to live a life that pleases God or pleases self? That's our choice. Amen. Praise God. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. Lord, we want to be children of the second chamber and the third chamber, of course. We ask for your mercies, your grace. We call on the name that shows us great and mighty, great and mighty things, Jesus. Lord, please continue to fill us and possess us and keep us thirsty and hungry. Set the boundaries that we don't depart from the second chamber around us. That we may walk in that place. Fulfilling your will, your desires, and not our own. As we wait upon you in everything we do. That your will would unfold and bring glory to your name. Now bless each and every one in this room, Lord. Bless them, bless them, bless them empower them, and keep them thirsty and hungry. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. amen. Praise God. Be blessed and stay dressed. With the